So introduce yourself to Georgia voters. Who is James Morrow? All right. Um, again, as you already said, my name is James Morrow, and I've been a teacher for the past 25 years, and I'm also a coach. In addition to that, I'm the regional director for the Association of Professional Educators located here in Atlanta. Um, I just enjoy what I do. Like my mother was a teacher and a coach for 39 years in Arkansas, and then my aunt was my business teacher. My uncle was my one of my teachers and my football coach. So I just I grew up around a lot of educators, and so I sympathize with a lot of the things that they have to go through on a regular basis daily. You mentioned you're in the classroom. Um, what what topic do you teach? Well, currently physical education, like, but uh, before that. I taught advanced placement, United States history, advanced placement, human geography, economics, world history, and American government. But uh, my principal, she did me a real solid by allowing me to teach um, physics education now because for the past 25 years, I've been in the classroom, you know, in the trenches, dealing with the students. Uh, what have you done in your role as a classroom teacher that would make you the strongest candidate to be state superintendent? Well, as most of my students would tell you from the past and the present, that Coach Morrow has a genuine concern for their well-being, and he always wants them to be successful. But sometimes it's hard to do that with all of the discipline issues that incur, that take place inside of the schools. You know, there's such a desperate need for teachers right now. Um, why not stay where you are and affect change at the local level inside the classroom? Why now? run for state superintendent? Well, it's like, I can only reach a certain amount of students, the ones that I'm close to, but as I told you previously, I'm in the trenches and I understand a lot of teachers are mentally, physically, verbally, and emotionally abused by students, by uh, parents, and sometimes by administrators. So I feel like this is the opportunity for me to speak up and let everybody know what actually goes on in the schools. Unlike most of the other candidates, they're, they're really speaking about what they've heard or, or what somebody has told them. But I'm actually right there on the front line and I can give a clear explanation of what's going on and what I feel needs to be fixed. So some people might recognize your name from a story, I think it was back in 2014, when you blew the whistle on illegal recruiting. Um, we never quite got a follow up. I'm not sure we ever knew whatever happened to that legal case. Well, I can't really speak on the legal aspect of it, but, you know, the situation was that um a couple of my players were illegally recruited and they had posted some uh, comments on uh, Instagram, I wanna say on Twitter, that, Twitter, <laughs> that they were uh, transferring and that they had been recruited. So when I brought it to the attention of the appropriate people, they got mad and uh, they fired me from my coaching position. So I hired uh, Mr. Eugene Felton as my attorney and uh, he went to work. If you can't talk about it, does that mean it's still going through the court system in 2022? Oh. Well, no, it's been it's 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 done, but uh, I just I signed an agreement that I really can discuss it. Got it. Okay, like a non-disclosure. Yes, ma'am. Okay, um, so you also ran for state senate um, in 2016. You ran for the house in 2018, I believe. Uh, your your opponents ended up winning those races, but you campaigned on improving and but kind of overhauling the state's educational system and developing mentoring programs. Uh, what would be your focus as state superintendent? Well, you know, and especially in the smaller rural areas, you know, I don't feel those kids get an opportunity. I come from a small rural area in Arkansas. Population was about 1,500, and uh, a lot of opportunities weren't offered to those students. So I want to make sure that those kids get a fair opportunity, just as the ones located in the metro Atlanta area. A lot of times they're neglected and forgotten about. So those are one of the things that I would like to do. How well do you work with those you disagree with? Uh, I'm, I'm a people's person, you know, and uh, I know how to interact and communicate with people without showing hostility or anger, even though I may feel it in my head, I, I won't really speak on it. You know, I always stay calm and keep my composure at all times. So, I mean, I feel like I can work well with anyone. You. If you are the superintendent, you would be in charge of 2,300 schools in Georgia. You'll be in charge of all of them. That includes districts that are in very rural areas, also very urban areas, and each one has 
different philosophies and different needs. How do you make decisions for all of them, knowing that they you each know, have as, different as a needs? Superintendent, you really can't like make decisions for them. Like you know, the local uh, school districts are the ones that create the policy and everything. But it's like you just make sure that as far as whatever the school board of the state implements, you just make sure that it's enforced. But I really can't lay down any laws, you know, but I can like make suggestions to them as far as what they need to do in order for their school district to be successful. But uh, safety would be one of the things that uh, we really need to work on in the schools. You know, now there's a time where uh, school has evolved. It's not the school that you remember. Now you can basically find any type of drugs, kids bring guns, knives, uh, they have sex at school. So, you know, we got to have some type of programs to discourage this, this type of behavior in the schools because they're allowed to get away with it too much. What do you think is the biggest threat facing education in Georgia right now? The fact that kids are just pushed through and they actually don't earn the grades that they receive. And like with COVID, you know, that, that put the education system like two and a half years behind because most of the kids were doing virtual. And, and um, a lot of times, you know, they wouldn't turn that because I, I taught virtual uh, AP human geography, you know, their answer roll and then they'll turn the camera off. They wouldn't turn it back on. Uh, they would never turn assignments. And it was like you're at home in the bed. Like, you know, what is the excuse? I felt like virtual was pretty easy. I mean, you can basically cheat without anybody knowing because you could go to Google and look up the answers for your tests and things like that. So but a lot of kids didn't take advantage of virtual. But now. If virtual was to continue, I would feel like it should be used as a tool for discipline, like the kids that are chronic behavior problems, then virtual would probably be the best place for them. Well, speaking of virtual learning, um, we just faced a pandemic. In fact, we're still in it in, in several ways. Um, what was the biggest lesson you learned about education through the COVID pandemic? The biggest lesson I learned was that um, it put the kids behind further than what they already were. When I taught middle school, um, basically teachers were encouraged to give students 50%. This is before COVID, 50% just for putting their name on the paper. And, you know, and I, I would ask, well, what's the rationale behind that? I would always question. And uh, they would say, well, whenever little Johnny decides to do some work, he, he won't be that far behind. But my thing was, you know, when they get out of society and become adults, they're not going to receive a full paycheck for doing uh, half of the work. So to me, it feels like we're setting these, some of these kids up for failure by allowing them to constantly just pass. Like um, when I was teaching um, AP Human Geography, these are like ninth and 10th graders. Most of those students, their Lexile score was like a three or 400, which meant they were reading on a third grade level. So, you know, my question, how did they make it to ninth and 10th grade if they're reading on a third and fourth grade level? What is your position on masks in schools now and moving forward as we combat these new variants? Well, you know, like I said, I'm there. So when we first started, you know, it was like mandatory to wear a mask. But when the governor, when Governor Kemp loosened up on that uh, mandate, you know, many of the students don't wear them. Uh, I, I ask them to wear them when they come around me or keep their distance. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm around probably well, I have one class in my physical education class, I have about 58 students. So, you know, and it's, it's kind of hard to like, you know, distance yourself when you have that many students in, in your class. And then some of the regular classes, they may have like 35 or 40 students. So again, it's hard to distance yourself when, when, when you have that many students in the class. And that's basically coming from the shortage of uh, teachers. You know, you don't have enough teachers, so you, you pile them in the best you can. So do you believe it should be mandated or do you believe it should be a choice? I believe it should be a choice. I mean, if you don't want to wear it, then that's you, you know, and if you don't want to be vaccinated, that's you. I've been vaccinated and I've had the booster, but, you know, I feel like people have the right to make their own decision when it comes to their body. What about vaccine mandates? There is legislation going through the Georgia legislature right now that would ban vaccines in school. It was rewritten. Um, recently to only ban the COVID vaccine only. What's your position on that legislation and vaccine mandates in general? Well, whatever the uh, senators and the state representatives, whatever they vote on and 
and it goes forward. And of course, I would have to uh, go along with it. You know, I really don't have a voice as far as if it goes through or not. But uh, if they decide that that's something that needs to be done, then I would have to enforce it. But do you agree with it? Do you think it should be enforced? Do you believe there should be a ban on the COVID vaccine? No, I do not. I believe people should be able to get it if, if they want to have it. They should be able to have it. Do you believe it should be mandated for kids to have the COVID vaccine if they go to school? Not their parents don't want them to have it. No, you know, that, that's their child. Like, if, if a kid becomes ill after taking it or not taking it or whatever, then the parents are going to have to deal with it, not the school district. The school district is not going to pay that child's hospital bill or any other medical uh, bills that they might incur because of taking it or not taking it. Do you think the pandemic created an educational gap that we'll be seeing for and facing for years to come? And if so, how do you think it affects our future workforce? Most definitely, it's, it's going to affect our. It most definitely is it's bad, and most definitely it's going to affect our future workforce because uh, many of the students, you know, simple things like they can't they can't write their signature. We 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 uh they don't know how to sign a document everything is printed so like and i feel like the lack of education that some of them receive is going to be hard for them to um, be productive citizens in a global society not not even just a global society but a local society so yeah it's gonna it's gonna be pretty bad how do we close that gap well many times school districts they offer uh after school tutoring, you know, uh, tutoring uh, during that planning period, but many of the students, they don't show up. Like when I, uh, they were paying me, I want to say $30 an hour to uh, tutor students after school. And uh, it was open to all social studies students because at the time I, I taught all uh, social studies classes, economics, US history, government, all of that. So uh, maybe three students took advantage of it. Now, you know, and then you would call parents and. Most of the times they would say they didn't have uh, transportation to pick their child up, you know, hours after school were out. So, you know, hopefully we, we'd be able to find some money where we could uh, pay for that if, if it came to that. But we have to do extra if we want to catch up. And the parents are going to have to do their part, too. You know, the teachers can't do everything. Yeah, we can teach and encourage and motivate, but we can't raise and discipline your child. And a lot of times that's what's going on in the schools. We have to stop class to discipline a child because of chronic uh, misbehavior in the classroom. You know, it seems like there is a widespread burnout happening right now. Teachers are burned out, families are burned out, even the students are burned out. How do you combat that burnout feeling and how do you keep incentivizing good educators to enter this field? Well, as far as the burnout, you know, that comes with a lot of work, you know, teachers, they have a hard time just getting up going to work every day, especially with a pandemic. And then you have students that, that, that curse you out, uh, disrespect you, they disrespect the custodians, the cafeteria workers. So, you know, one of the things we're gonna have to work on, as I said previously, was uh, discipline and, and the students having respect. And what was the second part that you asked me? How do you keep incentivizing good educators to enter this field as we're experiencing such a teacher shortage? And that's going to be hard to do because, you know, right now nobody's kicking down any doors to become a teacher. You know, the profession, you know, and when I started teaching in 1997, you know, that uh, the profession was like kind of basically taking off. I can recall my first salary was like twenty nine thousand five hundred dollars and I was happy to get it. But uh, now, you know, you have a lot of teachers, you know, that take home pay is approximately around twenty four hundred a month. And um their rent is approximately 2000 So in order for them to survive, they have to have a roommate or continue to live at home with their parents. So, you know, it's kind of hard to encourage somebody to go into this profession when they wouldn't make the money that they would make doing uh, or working somewhere else. But uh, as far as like bonuses, like I think we were just approved for a $2,000 bonus, which, you know, after they tax it, we would probably receive about 1400 of that 2000 which, you know, we was going to receive a bonus for teachers. I feel like it should be tax free and, you know, it should be a tax attached to it. You are entering the race for the top educational leadership position in what is 
arguably one of the most controversial times in education, especially over educational content in schools. Um, one of those hot button issues that is lighting up school board uh, meetings across the country is critical race theory. What is your position on critical race theory? Should it be taught in schools? And is there an age at which it's appropriate? Well, in those times, should anything be taught in schools where um, it would encourage racism, or would make a certain race of uh, students feel guilty about things that happened in the past. But at the same time, you know, some things need to be taught, but I wouldn't encourage critical race theory, but you know, racism has always been a normalized feature in American society, you know, and uh, as, we, as you and I both know, racism still occurs. But you know, when you look at the standards, like, you know, like I told you, I've taught AP United States history. A lot of things that it covers like the Miller Passage, uh, slavery during the uh, Revolutionary War, abolitionism, uh, the Civil Rights Movement, Jim Crow, segregation. So a lot of things are basically taught in the standards of the curriculum right now, but I guess it just depends on the tone of the teacher and how they teach it. But, you know, a lot of these things are discussed in the uh, United States history standards, uh, Georgia standards currently, because I talk about them, but, you know, I would say... Nobody should be villainized based on the things that their ancestors did in the past. Like, I mean, you know, a generation, the generation currently now, they can't be blamed for what their ancestors did, but at the same time, it needs to be known what happened. And so, but I wouldn't encourage anything where it makes anybody feel like they're wrong based on what their ancestors did. Let's talk about the equity conversation. Many districts are hiring diversity, equity, and inclusion officers or administrators or creating DEI offices within the district. Uh, what place do you believe that has in schools? I believe it's good in schools because, you know, every, every, everything helps. Like, a lot of times, whenever the budgets are cut by uh, legislation, you know, the wind blows wrong, the first thing is cut is education. So, you know, anything that they can bring to the table that would uh, benefit the students, the teachers, and the school districts, I would encourage it, as long as it's positive. Uh, let's talk about violence now. Um, there was a recent study that said a third of teachers surveyed in the classroom said they experienced at least one threat or incidents of violence, which um, is, is up and is concerning. Um, how do you deal with an escalating um, concern for many teachers regarding violence? And how do you discipline children before their brain is even fully formed? Well, uh, as far as the discipline and the threats to teachers, you know, being a regional director of an association for teachers, I hear a lot of horror stories. And, you know, one lady had told me that uh, she was walking to her car. I want to say she teaches French. She was walking to her car and a student told her, I see your car. Uh, I'm going to follow you home. I know where you live and I'm going to I'm going to F you up. And, and when she brought that to the attention of the administrator, uh, the administrator's response was like, oh, he was just playing. So, you know, like, but we have to take, you know, threats like that more seriously. And I feel like if a student says that to a teacher, there should be consequences immediately instead of just brushing it off. So a lot of times when threats occur, they're basically just brushed off because, you know, most school districts want to protect their statistics as far as when it comes to being a safe school. So what would be your plan for curbing those threats or disciplining in that moment? Well, hopefully, if I'm elected, you know, I would try to place uh, metal detectors at every entrance that the, stu the students enter. Um, as far as school resource officers, um, if you have 1,500 students, for every 500 students, you should have a resource officer. So if there's 1,500 students in the school, there should be like uh, three resource officers. Uh, we would need somebody mud in the parking lots, you know, have somebody riding around in a golf cart marking, uh, mud in the parking lots because a lot of times students leave campus and come back and you really don't know what they're bringing back on campus. So, you know, a lot of things could be curved if you be proactive, you know, and take care of it before it happens instead of waiting until it happens, then you want to do something then. Um, random drug searches, like uh, when I taught in Vegas, because I taught in Vegas, Las Vegas and Little Rock, you know, they would uh, have the students 
leave their bags in the classroom and they would have to stand out in the hallway and they would bring the dogs through. So, you know, if you do things like that, you would discourage a lot of violence and a lot of the drugs and things that take place. Also, I would want to, uh, I would want to uh, have some type of anger management classes for the students that are chronic behaviors uh, or constantly threatening uh, teachers and students. Teachers can carry guns in the classroom if their local school board authorizes it. Do you agree with that policy or not? Well, the local school board authorizes it, then, you know, I really can't do too much, but I wouldn't agree with it because a lot of times, you know, these kids can uh, get under your skin and if you haven't been trained properly, you might pull out your gun and shoot them. So, you know, I mean, that that's, that's something you have to look at because a lot of times kids, they want to put their hands on teachers, you know, uh, Kids can basically curse teachers out, disrespect them, call them all types of names, and you really can't do anything to them. But if you say anything out of the order, out of the ordinary, then uh, basically you're suspended 30 days without pay. You know, I have a friend that uh, he broke up a fight, and uh, he was told that he used too much force, and he was suspended 30 days without pay. And then a year later, he did it again. And, you know, I guess it's just in him to try to break up fights when he see students fighting, and he was suspended again this time. 45 days without pay. So a lot of times parents, you know, they'll see a video where a teacher is just standing around and not intervening in the fight because, you know, the teacher doesn't want to get suspended and, and, and lose their livelihood for trying to protect the child. So I mean, it's like a catch-22. You, you, you do it, then you're in trouble. You don't do it, then you're possibly still in trouble. So I mean, it's a lot of factors that need to be uh, discussed in order to fix this. Uh, let's talk budget now. Education is constantly facing budget constraints. Um, teachers are constantly reaching into their own pockets to get basic supplies for their classrooms. How do you work to take some of that burden off the teachers and make sure that education has the funding it needs? Well, the uh, QBE, the Quality Basic Education Act, it needs to be revamped. Uh, the last time they did something to it was 1985. I was in the fifth grade. I'm 47 now. So, you know, I mean, I feel like the legislators need to go back and revamp that and then, you know, bring more money. We can have more money in order to do things with the schools. So, you know, I, I would start with the legislatures because the legislation, because they're the ones that have the power to do that. Children seem to be facing larger burdens outside of the classroom now, perhaps more than ever before. Things that the classroom can't necessarily fix you know, poverty, instability, connectivity issues. Um, but how do you work to help children overcome those obstacles, even, even if you can't fix it? Because it does directly impact their ability to perform in school. We need to have more after school and mentoring programs for, um, with, with older uh, ladies, well, not, not necessarily older, but more mature ladies dealing with the young ladies and, you know, something for the men. But, um, and a lot of people are willing to do it. We just got to reach out to them and ask them to do it. You know, at uh, the school I teach at, we call something called uh, Jonesboro Dads, where the dads come through and they men mentor the young men at my school. So uh, that's, that's one th way we would be able to fix it. But, you know, it has to be incorporated and uh, the parents would have to be on board. But a lot of times the kids, they have adult problems, you know, uh, being a coach. You know, I would have uh, my student athletes tell me, coach, I can't come to practice today. I got to babysit my little brother, a little sister, because my mom works the graveyard shift tonight. So, you know, it's just a lot of these kids, they have adult problems, not all over, but, you know, in certain areas, especially areas of poverty, where their parents have to work or it's a single uh, parent household. And basically the older child is the one that's raising the uh, younger children. Um, but how important is testing in Georgia? And um, what do you think of the state of testing? Should anything be changed? A lot of times, you know, with the test, basically it's like something from the federal government when they uh, want to have testing and see uh, what has that child learned during that time period or while they were in school. But a lot of times I feel like, you know, teachers are forced to teach to the test instead of like just teaching basic uh, simple things about life. Like, you know, I feel like uh, everybody is not meant for college. So um, certain vocational skills should be incorporated in the schools. Like I would like to see something where, you know, when a kid graduates, they have their CDL license so they can go ahead and start working for a trucking company or when a young lady finishes cosmetology uh, class or 
create, uh, completes the program, she'll be able to have her license to do hair and things of that nature. Because, you know, like I said, everybody's not cut out for college. And a lot of these students are forced to take college ready courses. And, and they already know that they're not going to go to college. So we need to do something to fix that as well. So before you can get to the general election, you have to go through the primary um, and you'll be facing several other Democratic challengers with similar ideals. Um, what sets you apart from the pack? Uh, I'm a teacher. I'm in the trenches. I'm on the front line. I mean, if if I wasn't a candidate and because I'm a teacher and I'm looking at the candidates, you know, I would be like, and, and no disrespect to any of them, but because I understand what they're trying to do and what they want to do. But uh I've been in the education field. This is what I went to school for. I've been doing it for 25 years. You know, uh, I think one of my opponents is a dentist, one is an attorney, and one is a former state representative that uh, heads a charter school. So, you know, in my eyes, they really don't understand the problems, the issues, and concerns that teachers deal with on a regular basis. I mean, if I'm a teacher, you know, and there's over 130,000 teachers in Georgia. If I'm a teacher, I'm going for the person that understands what I'm going through and how I feel mentally and emotionally, because I feel like that's the candidate that's gonna do something that's gonna get the job done. Because a lot of times people hide what's going on in the school district. You know, many school districts depend on the ignorance of parents and the fear of teachers not to call them to the carpet because most teachers, they live check to check and they can't afford to rock the boat without basically risking their job. So if you do become the Democratic candidate, then you'll be going up against a Republican who was either an incumbent, is the current superintendent, or was a former superintendent. Um, how do you combat that kind of experience? Well, with uh, Richard Woods, he had close to eight years to get the job done. And I feel like he, he hasn't got the job done. So I don't feel like he deserves another four years. And as far as John Barge, he had the job and he resigned to run for governor. So he left the teachers and the students of Georgia hanging, in my opinion. So no, I wouldn't pick them either. James, thank you so much for your time this morning and answering all of these questions. Is there anything that I didn't ask you about? Anything else you think it's important that the voters know about you or what you would plan to do as superintendent? Well, as far as, you know, other teachers, and you know, I, I can speak in a, about an example of a situation that happened to me because this is another thing that discourages people to uh, stay in the education field. Uh, I was working in APS and I was the uh, Atlanta Public Schools and I was the uh, athletic director, uh, head football, head basketball, head track coach. And uh, I told my principal that uh, I wasn't feeling middle school anymore, but you know, the kids, you know, they're very disrespectful and rude. And, uh, I was gonna take a job at a high school. And she became very upset that I told her that in my last evaluation of the year, uh, she gave me 11 needs improvement in physical education. Now at one point she called me her shining star and I can do no wrong. But when I told her I wanted to leave, you know, that's, she tried to uh, block me and put me on a PDP, which is a professional development plan. And that's what administrators do to teachers when um, they feel like teachers are not doing their job. But sometimes, Teach, uh, administrators use it as a threatening and punishment tool to uh, keep you there. Or if they don't like you, they, they use it to run it away. It just depends, run you away. It just depends on how they feel about you. So, you know, if, uh, administra if I'm elected, if administrators continue to do that, then, you know, I don't feel that they deserve to be administrators and they should go back to being teachers so they can feel and understand what teachers go through. But this happens on a regular basis where administrators give teachers bad evaluations based on how they feel about them rather than their performance as a classroom teacher in the classroom. So that's one thing that I would want to fix. It sounds like you say there's a lot going on behind the curtain, so to speak. Oh, yes, yes. Everything is covered up and, and, and a lot of school districts are not being transparent. You know, and many teachers don't want to speak on it. But I tell you this, if you was to create a hotline for teachers to be able to call and, and explain some of the situations that's going on in their school, without having to let people know who they are. And I'm sure you would have a lot of teachers to call and give you some very interesting horror stories about what's really going on in the schools. Because the only reason they don't speak on it is that they don't want to lose their job, you know? And um, it's hard for teachers, you know, like in order for me to get my name on the ballot, 
I had to I had to basically sacrifice three months worth of mortgage. You know, I always try to keep at least a year's worth of bills in advance in case I lose my job because being a teacher is not guaranteed you're going to have a job the following year. So, you know, I took three months worth of my mortgage to, to get my name on the ballot. So I made a sacrifice and hopefully uh, the teachers will make a sacrifice and the voters and allow me to be the next Georgia State Superintendent of Schools. If you do become the next superintendent, how do you think that position will allow you to fix some of those behind the curtain problems that you know of going on? Well, I'll be able to call people to the carpet and put them on blast for the wrong things that they're doing. And, you know, and, and uh, you guys, once I come to you and explain to you what's going on, you're going to put them on blast, too. <laughs> Better bring receipts. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, James, thank you so much for your time. Um, I appreciate it and uh, keep in touch as your campaign moves forward. Uh, yeah, I, I'll call you and let you know how everything is going. All right. Thank you so much. Have a great day. All right. Bye. Bye bye.